If you've got your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to Psalm 30, that was the Old Testament lesson from this morning. I don't know if you've had recently a divine appointment. Um, those are fun when God arranges those things. He takes you and he puts you next to somebody that you didn't expect to see or to meet a need that you didn't expect that you'd be able to meet. Or in this particular case, I was in Greensboro at the end of last week for the Southeast Conference of the Evangelical Covenant Church annual meeting. And since I was all the way in Greensboro, I made an appointment to meet with my spiritual director. So I was meeting with him, and he lit his candle on the table that sits between us. And then he picks up a book off of this pile of books on his table, and he starts to read. And as he begins to read, I start smiling, and then I begin to chuckle. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up. I have not let my foes rejoice over me. And... I, he's like, what's going on with you? I said, well, this is a Holy Spirit thing. I'm preaching on that on Sunday. And that was our entryway into our, to my time of spiritual direction and his time of counsel and, and concern and care for me. So that was a neat thing. We've been doing the Psalter, the Psalms, for about the last year, year and a half. And we haven't worked our way all the way through them yet. But the Psalms are among the most popular books in the Bible. If you go to a Christian bookstore, you will see commentaries on the Psalms and books about the Psalms. And then you will see paraphrases of the Psalms and the Psalms put to poetry and the psalms put to music, and there are, it's a cottage industry all about the psalms all the time. And uh, there's a reason for that. There's among the most well-known, many of the passages are among the most well-known in the scriptures. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, we may look at that next week, is a favorite among many people. So these are passages of scripture that are familiar to people that read the scriptures and the psalms regularly. Um, and what we have here is a psalm of resurrection. This is the Easter season. Now, it's not about the resurrection of the Messiah, of Jesus, but it's about David's own experience. In verse 3, depending on your version, David was sick, sick to the point of death. David was laid out to the grave, to Sheol, to the pit, to, to death, to the depths. Depends on the translation, but he's been laid low. And God, he raised him up again. He was at death's door, and God has raised him up again. So this is a psalm that's completely and totally appropriate for this Easter season. So if you'll look with me, so there's a 30 on the page, and then next to that there's a superscript, and it says, A Psalm of David, a song at the dedication of the temple. I haven't talked a lot about these. There's a title. 116 of the 150 psalms have a, a, a dedication, a, a title, a, an introduction of some kind. And the critical scholars, the usual suspects, um, say that they should be ignored, that they're not part of Scripture. You know, everything that's on your page in your Bible isn't part of Scripture. Like this is on page 461. 461 is not part of the Bible. It's just the page number in the book. And so critical scholars say, well, that's the same thing about these titles, these superscriptions. And I think that they do them something of a, mis a, a disservice. Uh, they're ancient in their, um, they go way back. David didn't write a Psalm of David, a song at the dedication of the temple. He didn't write that. An editor, a redactor, came along later as they were putting the psalm book together, and he added that. But they're really old. The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and the Septuagint translated all of these. So they predate the Septuagint, 300 B.C. Um, and in fact, it, these, some of these are so old that the translators don't even know what they mean. In the Septuagint, they just carry the Hebrew word over because they don't know what selah means. They don't know what a maskil is. Um, so they just left the Hebrew word there and somebody smarter than me will figure that out and do it and then the commentators come and they have their opinions about what they think those words mean. But th there's ancient warrant to them. Um, the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew version of the Bible, which is what we have in our Bibles, the Old Testament, they contain all of these titles and uh, sub subscriptions, superscriptions. Um, so I think they're worthy of paying attention to. I mean, do they rise to the letter of the red letter in the Bible? 
eh, you can argue about it. I'm not going to argue about it. My Bible says all Scripture is inspired by God, so um, I'm going to go with what it says. And here it says that this is a psalm of David. And we know who David is. And then it gives this dedication, a song at the dedication of the temple. And the critical scholars say, well, obviously, that this is just wrong. And it's stuck on the wrong psalm because it says nothing about the altar. It says nothing about priests. It says nothing about the temple. It says nothing about sacrificial kind of worship, um, which is what goes on at the temple. So if you're going to dedicate the temple, wouldn't you include some of the themes? And the answer to that is, yeah, perhaps, but maybe not. So in 1 Sam, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13, David was told by Nathan, you are a man of bloodshed, and because of that, I will not let you build for me my house in Jerusalem. That will be left to your son to do. And so David takes that word from God, and okay, that's the way it's going to be. And so in 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verses 2 to 19, David spends the remainder of his life shopping, going to Lowe's picking up the specials, and he gathers all of the equipment, all of the uh, building materials necessary to build the temple so that when Solomon is ready to go, it's all right there, and he can put it together, and he can build the temple. And David was a songwriter, and so David had an experience, and he wrote Psalm 30. He had this experience, and he wrote Psalm 30, and then he gave it to Solomon and said, "When I'll be dead and gone, but when you build the temple and you dedicate the temple, I would like my song sung as a part of the service at the temple. In that light, this makes all the sense in the world, that this is David's experience, and there's, there's lessons in here that he wants us to learn and to take to heart. The psalm book is Israel's prayer book. And the prayer book teaches us how to worship appropriately, what kinds of things to, to sing and to, to uh, worship with, but also how to pray. And so this is instruction on how to pray. John Golden Gay says that there are three movements of prayer, three phases of prayer. And so this psalm illustrates these movements, these phases. The first is that something has happened so that there is a precipitating event. There's an incident of, uh, of some kind. And so then our response to that is we pray about it. Now, in the ancient world, and David, as he got older, they figured out quickly, um, when something bad happens, I'll go right now and pray about it. What we do is we try everything else under the sun. We exhaust all of our resources, and we try to go get help wherever we can get help. And then when we've exhausted all of our resources, then, then we go to God in prayer. So, but David knew that he goes to God in prayer. So the first phase or the first movement of prayer is to say what the, the problem is, to pray. John, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 15, says this, um, and I will do the version that you all have. He says, And we know that if God hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of Him. So the second movement of prayer is to know that because we have brought it to words and that we have prayed about it, that God hears us. Because that's who God is. God listens to the cries of his people. So the second movement of prayer is that God hears us. And then the third is that God, there's prima facie evidence, God has answered our prayer. And that's what we have here in Psalm 3. And when God answers our prayer, in the third movement of prayer, it's time to stop praying. Mommy, can I have a popsicle? Mommy, can I have a popsicle? And she gives me a popsicle, and I keep saying, Mommy, can I have a popsicle? That's, that's kind of offensive. No, after she gives it to me, what's the appropriate response? Thank you. That's right. And so this is a psalm of thanksgiving. We say thank you. And in our culture, we go to Hallmark, and we buy a card that says thank you on it. And then we write our name under that. And then we put it in the mail, and we send a thank you note. Well, that's not how it worked in the ancient world. In the ancient world, when we want God to know that we're grateful for what he's done, we tell everybody that sits still long enough for us to tell them all about what happened and tell basically our testimony. And so that there are three elements to that. There's a precipitating event. If you look at with me at Psalm 30, verse 3, 
Here is the event. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored my life to me from among those who go down to the pit. He is sick to the point of death. He's on his deathbed. He is laid out. And so then he prays. Look at verse 2. O Lord, my God, I cried to help to you for help, and you have healed me. So that there is prayer. And then there is the response to that prayer. Verse 1. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. God, you answered my prayer. Now, why isn't it linear? Why is it 3-2-1 instead of 1-2-3? David's a songwriter. This is a poem. This is a song. He's singing a song, not, and it's an artistic form. It's not a linear form. He's not writing it down for the newspaper. He's singing a song of joy and thanksgiving in the temple. And then in verse 4, so God has answered my prayers. What's the response? Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints. Hey, this is what God did for me. If he does this for me, then we know who God is. And if God does this for me, God will do this for you. So we sing these songs together. And when I rejoice, you rejoice because God has answered my prayer. And when I mourn, you mourn because we're in this together. And so David brings his thanksgiving to the temple. And he says this, God's anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night but joy comes in the morning. And this is the refrain that they sang together in the temple. And if we stopped at verse 5, we have a complete unit. We have the story that David wants to communicate to us. There was the precipitating event. He was sick to the point of death. He cried out to God, God help me. And then God answered his prayer and raised him up again. So we're done. But David isn't done. So he looks at what he's written and he decides that doesn't give God enough credit. I want, God, I want people to know more about what this experience was like. So he goes behind the bare facts of verses 1 through 5, and he fills in the gaps and the nooks and the crannies, and he repeats it again in verses 6 through 12. And he gives us a little bit more insight. Look at verse 6. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall not be moved. David is mature. David has come to the point in his life where he has extended the borders of his nation to their furthest extent. He is a regional power, and so the Philistines and the Edomites, nobody's going to mess with David anymore, so he's enjoying peace in his kingdom. He's a king, and he's got a wealthy kingdom, and so he is prosperous. He is comfortable. He is set. And that is no place for the people of God to be. And you listen to David. And, and the theologian Francis Schaeffer says, what is the American dream? What's the goal we all aspire to? Personal peace and affluence. And David has achieved that. And so he says, as for me, I shall never be moved. I've got the tiger by the tail, and it's all coming up roses, and it's me, 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 me. And in the next verse, it gets worse. By your favor, O Lord, you made, my, you made my mountain stand, my mountain. So Jerusalem sits on a mountain, and it looks down over the plains of Megiddo. You're going to go to Jerusalem, you go up to Jerusalem from whichever direction that you're coming in. And now David says, it's my mountain. It was the threshing floor of Eruana, the, the Jebusite, but now it's David's. And now there's a big city there, and now he's got this beautiful palace, and he's got it all, and he has forgotten God. What do we do in our wealth and in our prosperity and our comfort? We, we forget about God. What do we need him for? We've got everything that we need. We've got three square meals. There's food in my refrigerator. I've got hot and cold running water. I've got air conditioning and heat. I don't need God. And that's not a thing that God will allow or let stand. And so here's what happens. Second half of verse 7. You hid your face, and I was dismayed. Uh-oh. Oops. It all comes crashing down. You know, they say when you have your health, you have everything. Uh, you, you may have everything that you think you want, and then suddenly your health tanks, and you're not doing well, and you can't enjoy your prosperity and your comfort and your peace because you're in pain or you're fatigued or whatever the thing may be. C.S. Lewis says that God whispers to us in our pleasures. 
God speaks to us in our work, and he shouts in our faces in our suffering. And then he gets our attention. And so David realizes, oh, I have turned my back on God. I've acted as if uh, I was a practical atheist, as if there was no God and I didn't need God. Now, it says here that he hid his face from me and I was dismayed. You do know that God is spirit, right? And that God doesn't have a face, so he doesn't hide his face. This is anthropomorphic language that's being used here. David's just trying to make the point of he's feeling isolated. He's feeling rejected. He finally, now he's sick. Oh yeah, where's God? God, I need you. And now God isn't to be found because he's been neglecting God and hasn't been walking with God for some time. Um, it's, a, it's a metaphor. It's an image that is used a lot in the Old Testament. I like the way that Isaiah explains it a little better. Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah says, hey, behold, the Lord's not... His hand isn't too short to save. Hey, his ear isn't too dull to hear. He hears you, but your iniquities, your trespasses, your sins have made a separation between you and God. And your, what's the word he uses here? Your sins have hidden his face from you. Your sins have hidden his face from you. Who put the curtain up? Not God. Your sins have hidden his face. It's what we do that affects God. Um, I've heard people say this, and I don't agree with it at all. God is so holy that he can't look upon sin. Well, that isn't true. If that were true, he couldn't look at me, and he couldn't look at you, and he couldn't look at the world that he created. Obviously, that isn't true. It's not that God is hiding from us in his anger that he's turned away from us. It's that we have turned away from him. We're the ones that created the separation. It's our sin and our iniquity that creates this barrier. You remember Snoopy? And there was a kid in the group called Pigpen, and everywhere Pigpen went, there was this cloud of dust that followed him everywhere he went. Well, that's us. And we obscure God. God isn't obscured to us. I'm an evangelical covenant pastor, and our greatest theologian was P.P. Waldenstrom. And P.P. Waldenstrom says that the fall, sin, had no effect, none, on God's love for people or for his creation. He isn't the one who turned away and hid his face. We are. You remember the book of Genesis. God is walking in the cool of the day in the garden, and he's saying, Adam, Adam, where are you? And Adam's hiding under a bush. Adam, what are you doing up under there? Well, I was naked. Well, who told you you were naked? It's our guilt and our shame and the consequences of our sin that create this barrier, this separation between us and God. And so if we want to be in relationship with God, God does what he has to do to bring us back to our senses and to focus our attention where it's supposed to be. So, now we're back to verse 8. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to you, O Lord, I plead for mercy. God, I've forgotten all about you. I was complacent. I was self-satisfied. Everything's coming up roses. It's all good. And now I need you. So I cry out, what profit is there in my death? God, if you kill me, if I die of this illness, then who's going to sing your praises? Who's going to write this song for the dedication of the temple? Nothing's going to happen. Hey, but if you raise me up, then I will sing your praises, and I'll write this song, and we'll go into the temple, and we'll sing this all together, and you'll get all the praise and the glory. So God, do me a solid. And then we go from that right into 11 and 12. The answer to prayer comes like this. You have turned for me my morning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth. It's as if David in his repentance and his recognition of his sin and his self-centeredness and self-satisfaction is sitting in, in the dust throwing uh, ashes on his head in sackcloth. And God raises him up and strips that off and cleanses him and puts on festal clothing and says, no, we're going to have a party. Get the band and start dancing. Everybody up and dance. And the first five verses, he says, first there was weeping and now I have joy. Now, instead of that, there is, he's turned my mourning into dancing. And he's answered my prayer. And it wasn't just for him. This is a song for the dedication at the temple. 
You have loosed my sackcloth, that my glory may sing your praise. And this is a, not a particularly good translation here. That word glory in the Hebrew is chabod. It's chabod with an exclamation point. Glory! Glory is the response for what has been done. And everybody in the temple shouts glory. And then, why? That we may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. God loves his children. And whom the Lord loves, says Hebrews, the Lord spanks. Anybody like to be spanked? I don't particularly enjoy that experience. But whom the Lord loves, he spanks. And Hebrews again, all discipline, all spanking seems not for the moment to be joyful but sorrowful. But when God has finally gotten our attention, when we have learned our lesson, it yields its fruit. And so here is David in that experience. I'm, I'm self-satisfied. I'm a practical atheist. I don't need God. I've got it all. I've done it all myself. I'm a self-made man. And God says, oh, is that so? And now he's sick. Oh, where's God? I can't find God. God has rejected me. I'm all alone. And then God, he calls out to God, and God answers his prayers. He's come back to his senses. This is the story of the prodigal son. And what an appropriate song to sing at the dedication of the temple. And as David said, though our tears may come in the night, there will be joy in the morning. This is what it means to walk with God, that our experience of this goes with us. And if you count the names in there, it says, O Lord, in small caps. That's God's covenant name. That's God's name name. It's Yahweh. My name is Matt, his name is Yahweh, and he uses it nine times. I tell you all the time, triple repetition is important. This is triple, triple repetition. There are nine uses of his covenant name in this. David is back in fellowship, back in relationship with this God, and he's walking with him, and he's calling all of Israel to learn from this experience. You know, they say that that which is most personal is the most universal. People are unwilling to share their stories and to tell, particularly when they struggle or when things aren't going well, I'm a private person and they keep it to themselves. That's not what David does. Because it's personal, it's universal. We all experience the highs and the lows of faith and we, in bring, we can bring others into it that they can learn the lessons that David has learned here in Psalm 30. So. This, again, is David's experience of tears in the night, but the joy, the morning at night, but the dancing in the morning as he is reestablished in his relationship with God and can go forward in that relationship. Amen. Thank you, Sylvia.